Right, so let's double check. So the reason we're, we're highlighting the room in the castle is because I think symbolically we're, we're entering into the minds of the, of the Macbeths, going really quite deep into what's going on. That is quite convenient for, the, for what Macbeth then allows to happen, no, what Shakespeare, sorry, allows to happen next when we go into the head of Macbeth, okay? So he's entered with, with hot boys and torches. They're just basically people carrying torches. And he enters and passes over the stage a server and divers and servants with dishes and sort of service. So basically, there's a massive, massive banquet going on. Macbeth is not in the dining room. He is standing outside the dining room on his own. And people behind him are walking backwards and forwards. Okay, And it's servants with platters of food and jugs of wine and all sorts of other stuff to keep the banquet well and truly stocked. Okay, So, and now in comes Macbeth. Now, what has Beryl said? Uh, not very much. Okay, so we, what is the term that we use in drama where one person is talking, no one on stage is able to hear it apart from us? Stan? It is, good. It is a soliloquy, okay? And more importantly here, the servants going backwards and forwards, if he spoke this out loud and everyone could hear him, they would be able to understand that actually he's potentially plotting treason, okay? So this has to be an internal thing. This has to be inside his head, inside their homes. That's kind of the significance of that symbolism. So, let's have a look. If it were done, when, when it's done, then to a well, it were done quickly, if we're going to do it, then we need to do it quickly and we need to do it properly, okay? So the idea, we need to just end it once and for all. So here, Beryl has written consequences. Not that you can see. There we are. She's written consequences. Okay, so he talks about the consequences of Duncan's death. If we were to do it and end it all, in my head, this is Macbeth talking, these are the consequences. Consequences are events after the fact. Things that happen as a result of what's going on. We know, because we've done the research, we know contextually that when you fiddle around with nature, bad stuff happens. We already know the chain of being. We already know the natural world order is beginning to rock, beginning to shake on its axis. We've got Lady Macbeth, and Macbeth is a couple who just basically defy everything that is meant to happen. We've got the witches who are now involved in what's going on. That isn't going, that isn't going to sit well. And we've got Macbeth, who's already using the word murder. Okay, we have an idiot of a king. We love him, but bless him, he hasn't got a clue. And now we've got Macbeth weighing up the pros and cons of Duncan dying. And ultimately, should I do it? This is similar to Hamlet's to be or not to be, but not much. Okay, if I do do it, this will happen. If I don't do it, then this is what we preserve. And that's really important. What is he going to lose if Duncan dies? Okay. So at the bottom of, of the page from Beryl, and you can add this to the bottom of your page if you've got space, do it in the margins. Anywhere you can do it, do it on a post-it note. It doesn't really matter. She's written, the main thoughts, we have a reluctance to do the deed. Okay, so the first one, consequences to himself. What will happen to himself if he's the one that kills Duncan? And then also... What does that say? Dastardly nature. So basically the impact on what's going to happen to nature. So the destruction of, of the natural world, the natural forces, things that should normally happen. But mainly his reluctance to do the deed and consequences. For him, for the wider world. Or the, as in the wider world of Scotland. Okay. And this says here is a most marvellous example of Shakespeare's immense dramatic power, which I think is right. This is a an important scene for you to think carefully about. I can't give you any more clue than that. Okay? So we've got main thought, reluctance to do the deed, consequences to himself, and I think here it says dastardly nature, so the, the, the negative impact on nature. Because we know what happens. If he does kill the king... He's cast out God. Remember, he's replaced God and said, you don't count anymore. I'm going to make the decisions now, which flips the chain of being. That's the point when it flips. We haven't quite got there yet. Duncan is still, while well, he's currently stuffing his face and drinking a huge amount of wine because he's in the dining room. Remember where we are. We're not in the dining room. Macbeth is going through the pros and the cons. Okay? So he says, if the assassination 
could trammel up the consequence and catch with his success, success so if it could capture, prevent consequence, and catch the consequences successfully, that but the blow might be the be-all and the end-all here. So if, they're on, if there's no fallout, if, there's, if all of the ties, all of the bad stuff could just be caught up and dealt with and go away really, really quickly, then this, this could be it. This could be the be-all and the end-all. We don't have to worry about it. We don't have to consider the pitfalls of where we're heading. Okay? But here, right now, upon this bank and shoal of time, so this one here, we've got the reference of ships, Okay, and the movement of the sea. We'd jump the life to come. We'd risk it. We'd risk our lives. Then we've got a dash. Now, do you have a dash in your copy? No. No. The, no, the difference. We, the reason why we've got a slight dash here is because it's like a beat in time. It's like a do, and you can almost the the pause is quite perceptible. Okay, so in your copy, can you just kind of put like a dash between the word come and the word but? Because, bless you, dramatically, we, we've got a transition between one part and another part. Okay? Archie and Theo, is, there, is that the dash on the copy that you've got in front of you? So we're on line seven-ish? Act one, scene seven. So go to the start of Act 1, oh, Scene yeah. 7. Yeah, you there? So different, different editors will edit the play in slightly different ways. They won't change the words, but there is the shift in the punctuation, which actually, I think, alters the meaning quite significantly. So potentially here, we have like a do, okay, where he's done that bit, and now he's moving on to the next bit. It's almost like a paragraph break, but we don't, they're not paragraphs. But in these cases, we still have judgment. We've got morals, we've got ethics, we've got decisions. We know the difference between right and wrong. That we but teach bloody instructions, which being taught, return to plague the inventor. This even-handed justice commends the ingredients of our poison chalice to our own lips. I'm the soldier. I'm the one who does the killing. If I kill the person who's told me to do the killing, I'm going to get killed. It's sort of circles and roundabouts, Okay. We but teach bloody instruction. Return to plague the inventor. If I kill him, I will be killed. It's like the, the sort of the, the justified, sort of like uh, honor rights, if you will. Okay, in some cultures, and especially when originally when this was done, it was an honor right. You kill a brother, uh, that family will then come and kill your brother, and it's just a backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards. So it's quite a cultural sort of honor killing. They're honor killings. Okay. This even-handed justice is equal, commends the ingredients to our, of our poison chalice to our own lips. I may as well stab myself because I'm gonna, it, it's going to come back and bite me. Okay. Now, can you put a double slash there after lips and put a double slash after... No, that's fine. After lips. Okay, it's another do. Okay, another transition point. He then changes. This now is the, the justification not to kill Duncan. Okay? So these are the things he says about why he should not kill Duncan. It's so the first one. He's here in double trust. Okay? He's here in double trust. First, I am his kinsman with family and his subject, strong both against the deed. Okay, that's the thing, that's the first thing. Find me a reference. What reference can you make where he talks about honouring the life and legacy of Duncan? Where does Macbeth talk openly, publicly, possibly an illusion, because then we get his thoughts almost immediately after, where does he openly and publicly swear his allegiance to Duncan's life and Duncan's legacy? Ellie? Perfect. The service and loyalty I owe in doing it pays itself. Can you make that cross-reference here? Because he's confirming that now in his head. So that he's all sixes and sevens. He doesn't quite know whether he's coming or going or what's going on. Okay? But here he's confirming 
That is my duty. Lily? So this one here. So where he says in Act 1, Scene 4, okay, the service and duty that I, owe, that I do is more than something or other. What Ellie said. Okay. Then and then, then, so that's the first thing that he's, that acts against killing Duncan. You don't kill a guest that comes, when you have a sleepover, you don't intend on stabbing them. It's, it's not the done thing, really. He says, then, as his host, who should against his murderer shut the door, not bear the knife myself. This doesn't make sense. Why would I invite him over for a massive banquet to celebrate the fact that we've won the war and then stab him? I should be the one protecting him. Besides, anyway, whatever, this Duncan hath borne his faculties so meek, he's lovely, we love him, he's great, hath been so clear in his great office. What words did Duncan use that were clear in his opinion of Macbeth? All the way, this is Act 1, Scene 3, no, 2 or 4, done? Valiant. Valiant. Noble, what else? What other words did Duncan use to describe Macbeth? Brave. Brave. Miles? Cousin. Yeah, cousin. What about Act 1 4? Any word would Duncan use? Holly? Gallant. Gallant. Good. Okay. So Duncan is he's not lying. He is openly saying to the world, I think Macbeth is just the best thing since sliced bread. He is the bee's knees. Okay. When he comments that uh, Malcolm will be Prince Cumberland. Can you find me the line where he talks about the greatest sorrow? And I didn't, I got this from watching that production, actually. I hadn't picked up on it before. So, Act 1, Scene 4. Um, something about sorrow. This bit here. 35-ish, between 30 and 35, see if you've got the right page. Keep your finger on Act 1, Scene 7, so we don't lose it. Okay? My plenteous joys. Cross-reference to the idea he's meek and has... Um, so clear that his virtues will plead like angels. Okay? Plenteous joys, wanton in fullness. There is so much I could tell you. My heart is full of love for you. There is, is brimming. I'm overflowing with it but seek to hide themselves in drops of sorrow. What is he sorry about? Any? Not giving Macbeth the heir to the throne. Which is a really interesting concept, because then we get that dash, there's another, another doof, we need to kind of let that sink in before he then pronounces the fact that Malcolm will be Prince of Cumberland. He's not allowed to give, Mon to give Macbeth Prince of Cumberland. It has to be Malcolm. And he's devastated by that because Macbeth is awesome. He's incredible, far better than his son because his son got himself captured. Idiot. So, I don't like Malcolm. Okay. That his virtues will plead like angels, trumpet-tongued, against the deep damnation of us taken off. What sort of semantic field, meaning, so words around a similar meaning, do we have with like angels, trumpet-tongued? What is the impression of Duncan here? So semantic field are words around a meaning. A lexical field are words around a subject matter. Maybe this should be subject matter. Where do angels come from? Technically. Eating? Heaven. 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 And God. Trumpet tongued. Think about the angels. Think about your, your typical iconog iconic uh, paintings, and Shakespeare would have seen these. Botticelli was a 14th century Italian artist, and he would have seen angels with trumpets. Yeah? It's a really, it's a standard image that you get of angels. They're, they're trumpets, trumpet-tongued. He is heralding like a messenger of God. Okay? The words to commend Macbeth. Is Duncan a servant of God? Think carefully about this. Edie. Yes, he brings God's word to the world because Duncan is ordained by God. That's the whole divine right of kings. So here, you need to make a note of divine right of kings. The divine right of kings is only God will choose who will be the next king. 
Okay? Only God makes that decision, no one else. If you then choose instead of God, you've broken the divine right of kings and you've cast out God. That's the significance between the shifting of the chain of being. Okay? So the divine right of kings, you are ordained, chosen by God. We did that with the context research right at the beginning. As a result, you can use God to justify everything. Well, God said so, therefore I'm going to do this. Well, God thinks I should be able to have this, therefore I'm going to do whatever. Okay? So it can be manipulated by, by the monarch to basically explain away everything that they do. But only God can decide whether James will live, James will die, Duncan will live, when Duncan will die. Okay? The witches, as we know, haven't said that Duncan is going to die tomorrow. They've just said he's going to die. He is. He's old. That's what happens with people. Okay? But it's God's decision. This part here is further evidence of his placement in the divine right of kings. And then he says, and pity, like a newborn babe striding the blast or heaven's cherubim. All the language is to do with God's gift. Baby, gifts from God. Heaven's cherubim, little, little baby angels. Hang on. Horsed upon the sightless couriers of the air shall blow the horrid deed in every eye that tears shall drown the wind. Basically, he's so wonderful, so blessed by the heavens that there is no chance that anyone is going to get anywhere near him with a dagger. That any death that he has will be a beautiful death and it will be a death that God chooses because it's wonderful and so is Duncan. Excuse me. Then we've got another doof. Okay, so another beat. But have a look at some of the language. She's, she's put violence, so visual and tactile imagery. Blow the horrid deed in every eye. Whose eyes has he asked not to see? God's eyes. John T, what was the line? Yes, Elaine Macbeth says that. And Macbeth talks about not seeing. So the idea of seeing. Okay? The concept, the concept of sight. What were you going to say, sorry? Yeah, okay. Ellie? Okay, thank you. So we've now got another dash. A do. Okay? Just to kind of sink that in. So put a dash or a slash. And then he concludes. This is one of the strongest moments that we see of Macbeth. And I'm kind of unfortunately, it's one of the last. Really early on in the play. He says, I have no spur, no reason, no motivation to prick the sides of my intent. But only vaulting ambition. I want to be king. I, you know, that, that's a goal in my life, but... That's the only reason, but that's not enough. That's not enough to kill the king. Okay? Which overleaps itself and falls on t'other. So it's like it kind of overleaps everything and just kind of falls down on the other side. It isn't enough for me to kill him. Because that takes a small part of me out. And that kind of, that's where he finishes. What's important about this dash here? So all the dashes, he uses them all the time. But every time he uses it, it's a slightly different impact. What is the importance of this dash at a dramatic level in terms of, sort of theatrical presence? Lily? Yeah. Okay. So he's just said fairly categorically, and we're on the audience going, yes, Macbeth, come on, Macbeth, go team Macbeth. He's made the decision, he's made the right choice, we're back on track. Enter Lady Macbeth. And we're like, oh, damn it, we were so close. Okay. In she comes. How now? What news? What are you doing? Where have you been? What do you know? He has almost supped. Who's he? Eating? The king. Okay, so Duncan has almost finished eating. Okay, hang on. Why have you left the chamber? He's nearly finished his dinner. What did you get up and go out for? You're having a dinner party and someone gets up and leaves the dining room table and you don't know what's going on. Macbeth then focuses on Duncan. Has he asked for me? You know not he has. You know, you know he hasn't asked for you because he's absolutely, well, he's stuffed and he's more concerned about his food than he is about you. 
Now, this part is really important. We will proceed no further in this business. Okay? What type of statement is that? We've got four statements. We have an exclamatory with an exclamation mark, uh, an imperative, which is a command, uh, an interrogative, which is an interrogation, so it's a question, and a declarative, which is a normal statement. We will proceed no further in this business. Lily. Yes. It's an imperative. No, it's, uh, yeah, no, it is an imperative. It's a command. He's very, very clear about this. This is Macbeth being the Jacobean man we desperately need him to be. This is the man telling his wife what's what. This is him in command. Okay? So contextually, this is the, this is the Jacobean man. This is the ideal. He has, he's firm. He's clear. And then he kind of has to justify it. He doesn't need to, but he does. He has honoured me of late. And I have brought golden opinions from all sorts of people which will, now, which will be worn now in their newest gloss. I'm going to wear those opinions. I'm not going to throw them down. I'm not going to reject all of that praise. I'm going to wear it and I'm going to ride that wave. Why would I want to ruin all of that? And then, mm, well, she lays into him. She goes, was the hope drunk wherein you dressed yourself? Have it slept since and wakes it now to look so green and pale at what it did so freely? Question, question, question. From this time, such I account thy love. She's now emotionally blackmailing him. She's basically saying, so this is how you tell me you love me. Well, now I know. Art thou feared? Do be the same in thine own act and valour as thou art in desire? Are you too scared to behave like a soldier on the battlefield, to continue that strength and power in the things you want in life? What was her initial fear about Macbeth? Will. What was one of her fears in Macbeth? We get an Act 1, Scene 5. Look, go on, find me the line. You are there. Theo, you find it for me as well. You got it. Um, is it uh, yeah, good. He's too full of the milk of human kindness. Will, what, what is the line? So that everyone can write it down. Good. Act 1, scene 5, line 16. Make that a really good cross-reference. There's something else potentially that you could index. Wouldst thou have that which thou esteem the ornament of life and live a coward in thine own esteem? Go, oh, I dare not. Upon, wait, upon, I would. So the ornament of life is the crown. Okay, because that's what Beryl said. And she's saying, well, do you think that it's acceptable to have the crown and live like a pathetic coward? Because that at the moment, because you're simply too scared I dare not and she's probably going to put on a really really patronising voice okay now this bit here like the poor cat in the adage uh, do you have anything in your copies to explain what it is Edie Yeah, it could potentially be. It is also quite a common turn of phrase at the time. Now, what we've got in here is in my copy, it says the cat would eat fish but would not get her feet wet. So a cat will want to... Do any of you have cats? Yeah? So you know when... Um, so like the cat wants to eat the mouse but isn't prepared to put in the effort. Yeah? So the cat is prepared to go for the fish, like get it from a pond, but it's too scared of getting its feet wet. Yes, yeah, so, so, or the dog really, really wants a ball, just loves the idea of a ball, but can't cope with the ball. It's too much, too much for me. Okay? So they're basically saying, you really, really want it, you've got all the ambition, but you are pathetic to go and get it. A complete and utter wuss, basically. Too full of the milk of human kindness. And she, she does it. She says, she says in, her, in her speech, in Act 1, Scene 5, that he's got all the ambition, but none of the fire in his belly to go out and do it. So she's going to have to do it herself. She's already decided that, and she's kind of now making this quite public between them. 
She's desperate and she's infuriated by him because he's just a bit weak. He's weak. And he basically says, Prithee, peace, please shut up. Be quiet. I dare do all that may become a man. Who dares do more than be a man is not a man. Basically kind of saying anyone who tries to be a man isn't one. Because I am a man. I do everything that a man requires of me. That is his attempt to try and get a little bit more dignity. Do you think it works? Nope. She goes for him again. So, this bit here. Okay. Was the beast, what beast was then that made you break this enterprise to me? She's like, well, if you were a man, then what's caused you to break this promise? Enterprise is promise. When you durst do it, then you are a man. Okay, so we've got causation here. And to be more than what you were, you would be so much more than a man. So if you were, if you want to be more than you think you are, you would be even more of a man. You're not going to be less of a man. You'll be amazing. You'll be glorious. You'll be a god. So she's gone from emotionally blackmailing him to now massaging his ego. She tried one tactic. Did it work? No, he said, stop talking. She's like, right, okay, let's change tack. She's now going for a different tactic and now is massaging his ego in terms of his masculinity. Okay, nor time nor place did then adhere, and yet you would make both and they made themselves, and that their fitness now does unmake you. She's kind of said, don't undo things because it unmakes everything that you think you really are and everything you're capable of. So she's kind of supportive, kind of not. And then we've kind of got a doof, okay? So if you want to put a dash between, or a double slash between man and then you, the whole supporting the massage and the ego doesn't really last very long because now we get the I am in a worse position than you. Again, more blackmail. This is evidence that we have that they have had kids, but unfortunately those kids haven't survived. I have given suck and know how tender it is to love the babe that milks me. She knows what it is to have kids, and she also knows the devastation of what that is to lose that child. Okay? I would... Now, this is, this is a bit... This is dark. Okay? And this is where I want you to connect to the unsex me here speech. I would, while it was smiling in my face, have plucked my nipple from his boneless gums... Boys. What's the importance of boys... What, do, what are boys able to do but not girls? Is he? Like, like, yeah, absolutely. Boys inherit, girls don't. Yeah. Girls are burdens. Boys are the ones that make the family move on, okay? Remember the tradition, we can kind of park our feminist sensibilities. I've plucked my nipple from his boneless gums and dashed the brains out had I so sworn to you sworn as you have done to this. She is basically saying, I would have destroyed the heir to our family if you had asked me to. As you have told me you will do this. So she's using that desperate emotional distress of the loss of a child and the damage that that would have caused both of them and used it against him. Okay? Okay. Does her words work? What does he send say? Ellie? He's basically saying that's what happened to Prue. So yeah. So they have worked. All of this here, this is making thick my blood, stopping up the passages to remorse, milk for gall. All of this is now coming out. She has turned, in terms of her psyche, she's turned into this pretty appalling creature. His question, if we should fail. Now, that dash there means it is an immediate transfer of speaker. It's a rapid turn-taking. Now, turn-taking in some of these cases is really important, especially in this bit, because they, they turn-take rapidly between the two of them as the plan formulates, and then they're done. Okay, so it's quite a long start to the scene and then a rapid end to it. Now what Beryl has said is scornful impatience or calm dedication. Don't know, dedication possibly. So he's questioning. The fact that he's questioning means he's now going, okay, 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 I get what you're saying. Okay, calm down already. 
right now tell me what would happen. So her words have worked. And this, I think, is a really disappointing point for Macbeth because he lets us down. Because he's now saying, okay, talk to me how this is going to work. How are we going to get away with this? The fact that he's actually contemplating getting away with it would suggest he's contemplating the fact that they're going to do this. And her response is multi-layered. Her response is, well, we fail. Okay? If we fail, joint effort, not if you fail, not if I fail, if we fail. Can you circle the we? Okay? What, what cross-reference can we make to that we? Theo. Yeah, no, that, that's good. What else? Lily? My dearest partner of greatness. Is that what you were going to say as well? Good. Okay. They aren't. He, she, bit of a... Um, oh, what, what's it when you give away a plot? What's that called? Spoiler. Uh, she doesn't do the killing. She actually does no killing at all. He's the one that does the killing. He's a professional soldier. It's kind of what he does on a day job. But he says, we're, into this, we're in this together. If we fail, and she's like, then we fail. It doesn't work. He lives, we don't do anything different. It carries on, no one need know. Also, the exclamation mark could be, she's so flipping frustrated with him, she's like, well, then we fail. Okay, so it could be impatience at his dithering, because he really is. Or it could be the emphasis on, we fail, it's fine. No one need know. Nothing bad has happened. If we can't kill him, he's still alive. Crack on happy days. Okay? And then she says, but screw your courage to the sticking place and we'll not fail. So how has she adapted the pronoun? Because she's placing on someone's shoulders the entire responsibility for the success of this plan. But screw your courage to the sticking place and we'll not fail. Who ultimately will be responsible for the failure of this plan? Theo? Macbeth. It's going to be Macbeth. Okay, so here. And your courage. Pin your courage to the wall and nothing's going to go wrong. Toughen up, chap. Come on. Okay, and that's what she's mentioning here. Her whole tone, and what Beryl has mentioned here, is she becomes incredibly practical. She's got over the emotional blackmail. She's got over the ego massage. She, we've now seen a different side to her. She's really practical. She's got this in her head. She's making it very, very clear. This is the plan. This is what we can do. It's fine. Leave it to me, which is already mentioned at the end of Act 1, Scene 5, isn't she? So that's a bit of a cross-reference we can make there. So her tone shifts, and she's very, very practical. She says at the end of Act 1, Scene 5, leave the rest to me. Okay, so this is where Shakespeare's kind of making those secret links, making those golden threads come through. This then now is the plan. When Duncan is asleep, where to the rather shall his day's hard journey sound to invite him. Ha ha ha, he's going to be so tired, he's had a hard day. Oh, shame, he's going to go to bed early. His two chamberlains, guards, will I with wine and with sail so convince that memory, the water of the brain, shall be a fume, and the receipt of reason, a limbeck only. She's going to basically make them so hammered, going to make them drink so much alcohol, and possibly drug them, possibly, that reason and memory of what's going on doesn't work. Everything's all just a bit of a blur. They don't quite know whether they're coming or going. When in swinish sleep, their drenched natures lie, as in the death. So they are going to be so completely knocked out, nothing, nothing, even the world ending is going to wake them. What cannot you and I perform upon the unguarded Duncan? So this is she is relishing about how vulnerable Duncan will be when his two guards are so completely out of it. They don't know whether it's coming or going, okay? What shall, what not put upon his spongy officers who shall bear the guilt of our great quell? 
What's the plan there? Ellie? Blame it on the guards. They were so drunk that they killed Duncan. And they were so drunk they don't remember killing Duncan. But there's proof, isn't it? Because Duncan's dead. What actually ends up happening is that she then smears the guards' faces and their hands with the blood of Duncan to basically frame them. Okay, she places them and causes them guilt and sort of makes them guilty. Macbeth then has a, has a bit of a moment. He kind of loses the plot, um, which Lady Macbeth is very irritated by. Um, and he goes and stabs the guards. And they're, they're like, why did you kill the guards? Oh, I was so angry and infuriated that they deserve to die because he's automatically making a very public, out-of-control proclamation that he's basically been judged, jury, and executioner for these two guards. They had no idea. They were basically dead to the world. Look at Macbeth's response. Bring forth men, children only. It's worked. It's absolutely categorically worked. He's like, you're amazing. Let me have your children. Because your children are brilliant. Okay? For thy undaughtered metal... Okay, it was kind of sort of metal, as in like actual metal, it's just a different spelling. Should compose nothing but males. You are so incredible, there's no ounce of female in you, so therefore any children you have will all be men. Rah. Will it not be received when we have marched with blood these two sleepy of his own chamber and used their daggers when they have done it? Okay, so we've now got significant contrast with Macbeth from what he was earlier in the, in the scene. So we've, been, we've had the start of the scene where he's dithering and dancing, going, mm, uh, not too sure, yes, but no, but yes, but no, can't possibly. So now going, yes, Lady Macbeth, you're amazing. Let's do it. Okay, so massive, massive shift in terms of Macbeth as a character. And really, possibly, this very slippery slope that he's now on, and he then becomes unreachable. Okay, who dares receive it other? Who would question otherwise? We place our daggers, or no, we use their daggers to kill Duncan and then put it back next to them. Who's going to challenge it? As we shall make our griefs and clamour roar upon his death. She's already saying we are going to overdo our utter distress and grief that Duncan has died. Really, really play to it. She fakes, he goes a bit crazy, Okay. And then he says, and this is the end of the act. And Beryl says, what an end of act. Okay? It's, a really, it's an incredibly dramatic scene. I am settled and bend up each corporal agent to this terrible feat. Away and mock the time with fairest show. False face must hide what the false heart doth know. Public and private. Truth, truth and illusion. Innocent flower, serpent under it. My fay in your face is like a book. Let's just pretend we love him. We're going to get away with it. And that is the end of the scene. Okay? This bit here, away, and mock the time with fairest show. Go away, let's just pretend we're getting ready for bed. Okay? So the idea of mocking is kind of ridiculing the idea that we're getting ready for bed. Okay? So she's added down here, before it was Lady Macbeth that said, look like the serpent, but be, look like the flower, but be the serpent under it. Now it's Macbeth that is saying it. Similar to the reversal, fair is foul and foul is fair, hover through the fog and filthy air. Foul and fair a day I have not seen. She says, look like the flower, be the serpent under it. He's saying, false face must hide what the false heart doth know. So we've got two examples of where he shifts and he echoes the, the dark words of, the, of really the dark and twisted character around him. First one were the witches, where he's possibly subconsciously saying it, so he's ne not necessarily aware of what's going on, but remember, he's already marked. This time, he is consciously saying it. So this is where that noble, valiant, glorious, brave, worthy cousin, an amazing creature is now beginning to fall. Is he aware of what's potentially coming down to him? We know it's coming down to him. No, he's now riding. As far as he can see, the world is very, very brazen. He's going to get the crown. He doesn't understand 
or appreciate at this point, because he's in the thick of it, the significant consequences of what's going to happen. 